attended and spoke at the public review of the Rooming House Review on July 10, 2013. After that meeting, I was sure to provide my own feedback on the options presented and can see a few of my points in Appendix 2 of this latest recommendation. After reviewing these latest documents made public, I would like to raise the following points, comments, and questions. Number one, the report indicated that residential dwellings are essentially operating as a hotel, hotel being regulated in the same manner as a bed and breakfast home stay, uh, indicated on your report page five. It states that it must be an owner-occupied dwelling and it would fall under the discretionary use clause. So why create the residential home stay land use for these 30 days or less short-term accommodations, allowing the owner not to occupy it when it was just identified that these residential motels or hotels are functioning, functioning along the same lines as a bed and breakfast? Could the city not simply expand the definition of BBH to include a residential homestay and enforce the same rules? How are bed and breakfast homestays or residential homestays not considered a business operation? The city of Regina has listed some prohibited uh, home-based businesses under, under a business license. How do these types of activities not require a business license and fall under the same restrictions? I would also like to see some clarity provided about what kind of weight or priority to put on public notification or feedback from neighbors or neighborhoods when considering discretionary use. I have a young son that has a visual impairment and I feel that the city permitting this type of transient use of the property immediately next door to me poses a degree of safety risk for my son and also for my daughter. I moved into my house and neighborhood because I expected it to be safe for my family. If I wanted to live next door to a motel, I would have asked Super 8 or the Sandman if I could build the side of Number two, did the city attempt to make the definition of long-term rental properties more simple? If the owner does not occupy the dwelling, it must be considered a long-term rental, requiring leases of greater than three months. Number three, did the city consider permitting only owner-occupied dwellings to apply as a BBH or residential homestay variant to offer short-term stays of 30 days or less. This would still require discretionary approval after consideration of public notification feedback. Having the owner occupy these dwellings may help to ensure the integrity of the home and the neighborhood. Number four, with respect to rooming houses, I still believe that the number of tenants or occupants should be regulated because even with the clause that no cooking facilities can exist in <coughs> rooms, there's nothing stopping a microwave and or toaster oven appliance from being used. These could pose a fire safety risk with other occupants. Number five, lastly, I would like to see that modifications to residents to modify living space to increase the number of available rental rooms should be regulated and monitored through building permits. With the living spaces removed to make space for more rooms, these no longer remain as dwelling units, rather they become bedroom units. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Zerr, for your presentation. Questions? Councilman Durham. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zerr, for coming forward. A couple of questions uh, to Your Worship. Uh, you you made a su suggestion about uh, a homeowner being required uh, to be living at the dwelling for uh, providing a short-term or transient type of accommodation. Can you uh, explain what you mean by that, your reasoning? Well, I have a few reasons why I made this suggestion to uh, require the homeowner to occupy the dwelling, offering short-term accommodation. First, the bylaw states in section 6D.1, subsection 1.8 for bed and breakfast, and in section 6D.5, subsection 3 for rooming houses, that the owner shall occupy the dwelling. Second, with respect to the turnover of short-term state transient vis visitors, having the owner on premises provides an immediate escalation point for tenants. Um, in a similar manner to dedicated commercials or motels or, or hotels having a front desk. Third, I believe that requiring the owner to maintain a presence at the property will have the owner have a vested interest in the upkeep of the home in their neighborhood, as well as enable neighborhood residents to actually get to know that owner. Second, there are uh, um, contain more than two bedrooms. Do you feel that limiting rooms rooming houses uh, or a residential homestay uh, would be appropriate? Yes, um, both of those specific situations identify a limit on the number of rooms that can be offered for accommodation. However, the rooming house section of the bylaws has neglected this. Yeah. Uh, I believe that including an additional clause to limit the number of rooms permitted in a rooming house um, 
should be established. I would then expect that a required development permit would include reference to the specific rooms in the house to be offered for occupancy. Um, in this way, I think that it would allow for control of the land use of the property, but not necessarily the occupants within. It will dictate nothing more than the permitted number of rentable rooms, not whether they're rented, rented to blood, blood relatives or not. That being said, I find it prudent uh, that I would need to adjust point four of my previous brief to not necessarily control the number of tenants or occupants. You mentioned about removing the rooming house from land use. What's the position? Personally, I'd like to see the rooming house land classification remain in Chapter 6 of the zoning bylaw with some additions to control the number of rooms permitted in the dwelling, as I've alluded to. I would, however, like to see the definition or interpretation of it outlined in Chapter 2 to be updated. I would like to see the definition amended to be something more along the lines of rooming house as a building that is the primary residence of the owner and in which the rooming units are provided by the owner for temporary or permanent occupancy and compensation. So I'd like to see the verbiage around persons not related by yeah. blood or etc. to be removed. And that hopefully will remove the challenges for enforcement of that. Mr. Uh, one question. You mentioned something about discretionary use, and uh, your um, and maybe I'm just digging into it. How do you feel about that? Do you feel that if uh, let's say there's a discretionary use, uh, and the neighborhood gets uh, informed with a pack and letters, do you feel comfortable that the administration will do a good job to inform you and listen to you if you will say that you are opposing certain things that's going to come to you? So can you just give a little more on that? Uh, actually, I'm, I'm not confident in that, with that, Council Fredero. In fact, um, you know, the discretionary use and notifying the public seems very vague to me. I, I don't have confidence that um, an overwhelming no vote from a neighborhood carries enough weight as part of the decision process, and it, it's not very transparent about how that factors in. Um, that that's one thing to notify the neighborhood, but I, but I, I feel that it should be more clear of what kind of. Um, what kind of weight that that holds as part of the decision making process for the discretionary use? Okay, one more question. I'm uh, living next door to a motel <coughs> in the residential area. Just give me a little more. How do you feel about that? I feel ripped off. Um, that's not what I moved in for. Um, the excessive amount of parking that, I, that I'm, I'm, I've fought with through the winter, uh, blocking access for the care home that lives around the corner, but their accessibility buses can't make it through. The public city buses or, or the public school buses were actually uh, redirected and advised not to come down the crescent and have the kids walk to the end of the street as a, as a collection point because the accessibility just simply wasn't there. And um, but the coming and going and, and the transient nature of, of, of that type of operation happening, uh, it just has no place in, in, in the neighborhood. Thank you for that. Other questions? <coughs> Return the gallery and we'll the If you could identify yourself, who you represent, you have about 10 minutes for presentation. And then the questions after. Mr. Mayor, the Mayor, for Zero. Press the button. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The Worship Mayor, for Zero, City Councilors, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Brian Block and I have my neighbor, friends, and relatives, including Luke Lemoyne, with me. We are here representing the citizens of Hillsdale Newport Park, located in the South Central area of Regina. I've lived in this part of the city for over 33 years. We have a community with great features, but in the last several years, we've noticed a significant decline in the community spirit and character. We attribute this to the increasing number of houses that are being converted to family homes and properties, offering individual rooms for rent. My fellow neighbors and I are here this evening to oppose the city administration's proposal have City Council adopted past features contained in option one, removing the rooming house definition from the zoning bylaw and not regulating rooming houses at all. This option one was initially presented by City Administration at the July 10, 2013 meeting over three months ago. Based on other public citizen statements to city officials at other public meetings and 107 survey results that the city received after the July meeting, it's apparent that option one was not everyone's first choice. In fact, it was very obvious that the community wants additional regulation of rooming houses that is sorely absent from the city's bylaws and has created numerous problems in the neighborhoods where they exist. It was very uh, interesting that the city chose 
to adopt regulations to address the issue of short-term rentals, rooms rented by the night or the week. The city identified bylaws which would be effective in shutting down and or regulating these illegal hotel operations. The same principle applies to rooming houses. The only way to address the problems associated with rooming houses is to effectively regulate them. The city's proposal leaves many unanswered questions. How does the city intend to protect the tenants of rooming houses who are exploited by landlords and often live in dangerous and unhealthy living conditions? Do tenants' rights fall secondary to landlords' rights? Does the city approve the current rooming house operations that upwards of 17 individuals living in a single detached dwelling zoned and designed for single family occupancy? Is this seen as a solution the city is seeking on the affordable housing problem? In terms of communication, the proposal lacks any mention of providing residents with essential details required to keep the community informed. How does the city expect residents to respond when nothing more than whether a case is open or closed is provided in regards to city's concerns? Why is there focus on the enforcement of existing bylaws in the city's own admission that cannot gain access to rooming house properties to determine whether any bylaws have been violated? As it is clear, the rooming house problem will not be directly dealt with the bylaw changes. My neighbors and I have prepared a list of the likely future outcomes for our communities. If option one, the non-regulation of rooming houses is allowed to go forward. Removing instead of improving the definition of rooming houses and removing it as a land use and a zoning bylaw compounds the very problem identified by the community and by administration that led to these bylaw changes. The adoption of no regulation and no use of the land use definition will have serious negative consequences for the problems of tenants, the condition of housing stock, and our neighborhoods. Protecting the tenants, first of all, without the regulation, property owners of rooming houses are less motivated to maintain safe and healthy conditions for the tenants, as these houses are unlikely to be inspected for code violations. Two, the provincial fire code regulations for smoke detectors, adequate sized windows, and the type of windows that do not freeze shut for sleeping accommodation will not be checked. This heightens the safety risk for tenants living in substandard housing. Three, apartment suite tenants are protected with strict life and safety provincial regulations that the city is responsible to enforce. However, rooming house and illegal suite tenants are not provided with the same protection. Four, other Canadian cities have set up a licensing system for rooming houses that provide the right for fire, health, and other inspectors to periodically visit these rental buildings and determine if they can contribute to continued operating. If conditions are found to be dangerous and are not corrected within a short period of time, they lose their license and they cannot continue to rent out rooms. Some violations face financial penalties. Condition of housing stock. First of all, noticeable lack of maintenance with rooming houses. For example, lawns are not cut, weeds grow high, broken screens and windows are not repaired, paint peels in the house, shingles curl up and are not replaced. Shrubs are not pruned, garage doors are left half open and garbage litters the yard from overflowing garbage bins. Substandard repairs, providing common areas of house, etc. are not by law fractions and the city will not be able to correct them or counteract them. Two, tenants are often forced to or instructed to park off the hard surface driveways on adjacent front yards, damaging the appearance and drainage of the properties. They have also blocked access to adjacent property driveways and parked in sidewalks, running them from house to disabled citizens. Thirdly, the city's recently researched official community plan outlined that they determined there is a significant number of houses in our city that are severely in need of repair and restoration. Allowing more properties to become rooming houses will surely add to the dismal state of housing stock. Fourth, creating as many rooms for rent in a house to maximize profits changes the future use of the house. This limits the utility of the house for future tenants, owners that do not require a chopped up house that has ten bedrooms. The future cost to turn the house back to its original design will be too expensive for owner occupants. Fifthly, most of the older houses in our city do not have large enough or a sufficient number of basement windows to meet fire code regulations. The city will be encouraging slum landlords to rent unsafe, hazardous rooms and basements. Must a tragedy occur before the city takes action? Impact on the community. The surplus number of vehicles resulting from a rooming house that does not have sufficient driveway spaces affects the ability for school buses, emergency and other essential vehicles to drive down the street. In some cases, the streets are impassable in the winter, preventing emergency vehicles from safely accessing streets. Secondly, Hillsdale and Whitmore Park residents are currently upset about the negative impacts of the unchecked proliferation of rooming houses. The negative impacts will only further multiply as the city implicitly approves of these arrangements 
through the deliberate lack of regulation. Resident satisfaction will further decrease, resulting in residents spanning the area, and the area becomes known for substandard housing and overcrowded rooming houses. Third, homeowners may decide that they want to move away from areas that are more likely to become rooming houses because of the rundown housing. The extra noise at various times of the day, the inability for them or emergency vehicles to drive on the streets. Fourth, rental of rooms without a living owner or caretaker has greater problems for surrounding neighbors that is very difficult to resolve because there's no one in charge to talk to that may correct the problems that exist. The city administration has provided evidence of the 2013 meeting, July 2013 meeting, that other Canadian cities have designed and administered a licensing system for rooming houses. It was our hope that the city council would adopt the best solutions found in other cities. We had expected more from our city council. Since Mayor Fujero was quoted on the CBC Radio Afternoon Show on July 10th, 2013, promising that if the majority of people want proper regulation of rooming houses, then the necessary resources would be made available for it. We're disillusioned with the lack of support for our residentially zoned areas of the city, where owners and tenants have their homes. Our communities, and in fact the city, is now being swamped with longer stay rooming houses with no limitations on the number of rooms rented, and will deepen the degradation of our neighborhood housing conditions. How come other cities are able to govern these that we can't? We have not been provided any substantive reasons why this has to be a chosen policy and believe the city administration does not see the picture. The city has declared that they will deal with all rooming house problems using enforcement and education. It is difficult to believe that this can be accomplished when they do not have a rooming houses registry and admit that they cannot even gain access to rooming houses or illegal suites unless they are invited in. At a June 2013 meeting, city planners were provided a Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation report produced February 27, 2007, that was done on rooming house regulatory practices and conditions in 11 Canadian cities. It declared in its findings that, quote, licensing appears to be a key component for effective regulation and enforcement for rooming houses. Most inspectors rely on provisions in municipal license and bylaws for the right of entry to carry out inspections in an expeditious and regular manner. Without these bylaw provisions, inspectors would have to depend on various provincial statutes, some of which present constraints that could delay or even frustrate inspections. All of the profiled cities that seem to have effective control of the rooming house stock utilize regular inspections. Two of the cities have reinstated regular inspections after having temporarily inspected complaints only. In both cases, the return to regular inspections was supported by local studies that indicated a deterioration in the condition of rooming houses, end quote. Once again, Your Worship, Mayor Fougere, the city councillors, the residents of Hillsdale and Whitmore Park implore you not to vote in favour of the option one proposal. Instead, work towards a licensing bylaw that can adequately regulate rooming houses in Regina. Once again, we are asking you to vote no for the future benefit of our community. We care too much for our rooming houses to destroy our neighbourhoods. Thank you. So my question for you is the CMHC report that you mentioned that was sent to council, and I also got a copy of that too. Could you talk for a few minutes about what they said about other types of regulations other than licensing? Were there any of those mentioned in that longer report? I have to admit I haven't read the report for quite some time now to really answer your question. There must have been other regulations probably associated with property maintenance. I know the City of London, Ontario, which is one of the cities the city apparently contacted about their rules and operations, I noticed that they have a property maintenance bylaw that ties in, that links in with the residential renting bylaw that they have that controls the rooming houses and other rental properties. Okay. How would you see the strength and enforcement that's talked about in these recommendations? Do you see it possible to strengthen that enforcement of the bylaws that are already in place? 
but you see any other bylaws that should be in place to accompany that that might be useful? Um, I, I really can't think of anything else. I know the city has uh, been uh, quite diligent in uh, parking enforcement and increased the number of enforcement uh, people. And, uh, we do get uh, fewer problems, at least this time of the year. I'm not sure what the winter will have in store for us, but uh, there is, um, I think, you know, uh, parking spaces uh, being uh, identified in the current bylaw, it's only bylaw deals with room houses, at least there's some discussion there about off-street parking, a requirement to have that. Uh, with the elimination of rooming houses from the bylaw, uh, what uh, requirement is there of these rooming houses to have off-street parking? There won't be any. And so, with you know, the great number of people that, uh, that live in these places, they do have a lot of vehicles, and uh, you know, there's a, a problem, like I mentioned in my brief here, that uh, it, my experience was that we couldn't get uh, school buses or other emergency vehicles down our street, and uh, most of the neighborhood had to detour uh, because we couldn't get through that long enough. And I've heard from other people too, it's the same situation. Residential streets were not uh, set up to accommodate that kind of traffic. So when you look at the parking part of this report, there's probably more work to be done on how there might be a plan for dealing with parking on residential streets when they're narrow streets. Um, you weren't the first person to talk about that this evening. So would you say that's something we should be spending a little more time on here? Uh, I would think it would make sense. I know the city has uh, permits in certain areas of the city that have higher traffic parking demands. And, uh, similarly, something could be maybe looked at as having uh, permits and trying to control the number of vehicles in our park on the street. I'm not sure if that would be so That would certainly cut down uh, some of the problems we're experiencing, especially with that snow on the street and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to play devil's advocate first, so just bear with me as I ask the question because I'm overlooking. You have to definitely talk a little bit about parking and about day three, and I want to identify that because the previous delegation uh, who would have had a similar view did not. So I'm going to ask you this: uh, if there was no issue with parking, if we were not having any concerns with parking, but all the other things that you've talked about, would we be having this discussion? Yes, it certainly would, sir. Yeah. Yes. Okay. If we had no problem with parking and no problem with debris, would we still be having this discussion? Yes, we would, sir. Okay. And so, I'm, I'm obviously, the question is leading into and say why. What's what's the heart of the issue? Well, the heart of the issue, I guess, would be the deterioration of our neighborhood, as I indicated in my brief. We have houses that uh, are getting very ratty looking. Uh, like I said, the uh, you know the inattention of the uh, landlord and the owner of the property uh, and uh, Luke here can talk to that. He's experiencing that right next door to his place and around his neighborhood more than I am. That these places get run down. They've got uh, people that own these houses uh, and they don't have any caretaker or supervisor there and uh, over time they just get, uh, get uh, looking very uh, unattractive. And, uh, you know, people take pride in their homes in our community. Uh, you know, we have older homes, uh, some of them maybe 60 years old in some cases, but you know, people do spend some time and money on them, and, uh, and they pay a lot of money for these houses when they buy them. Uh, so we'd like to see the same kind of uh, proper maintenance of buildings in our neighborhood. That's, that's an area that we feel is critical as well. And as well, too, the, uh, the people who are these buildings, and, you know, I was a student one time when I had gotten a housing. I expected to see you know, some kind of uh, protection from the governing bodies in the community that would look out for them, uh, for health, health and safety. Uh, I looked across the street at my neighbor's house, she's from this room house. They had eight people in there. Uh, they put five rooms down in the basement. They have one small little window. They don't have a safe way to get out of that building. So I'm looking out for these people too. They don't seem to have the voice, and uh, I, I think they need to be looked up for as well. So they are my neighbors, uh, even though they're neighbors, short term neighbors. Uh, we've got to look out for them as well. I think really house uh, deregulation, which is occurring here, is just going to make things worse. And, and 
we're just going to have to deal with those bigger problems later on. Good. Thanks for your answer. So uh, one other question. I, uh, I believe the suggestion that you're giving is about more regulation of law enforcement. And with that comes cost. So how do we recover the cost? Well, um, I guess you'd have to talk to some of the other uh, cities that have dealt with this before. Uh, as I mentioned in my write-up here with the CMHC, uh, they looked at uh, 11 different Canadian cities, and 10 of those cities out of the 11 have licensing bylaws. So certainly they looked at what works and what doesn't, and I would think the city should be able to look at some of the practices that those other municipalities use in, uh, in dealing with these topics. And, uh, like I said, the, uh, the enforcement aspect is good, but if you can't get into that building unless you're invited in, and most tenants probably won't speak up because they know they're going to lose their place to live, uh, then who looks out for it? You know, it's, uh, uh, it's really something we need to, to deal with here. Please come to know. Other questions? We're going to have to return to the gallery and we'll continue on with our discussion.